Welcome back to another episode of the Religious Studies Project, folks. My name's Chris Cotter. I'm joined as ever... David Robertson. Hello. By David Robertson, indeed. And uh, today is a, another historic moment for the Religious Studies Project. And we've got a new series for you, which is on religion and NGOs. Uh, and this has been sponsored by the Henry Luce Foundation and edited by R. Michael Fiener. And we've got a few of these coming up for you um, over the coming weeks. Um, but we're going to alternate them with our standard output. Uh, but today, um, we've got an interview on Muslim NGOs and civil society in Indonesia. And that's an interview with Robert Hefner. I'm going to pass over just now to Catherine Shear and Giuseppe Bellotta to tell you more. Take it away, guys. Welcome to the Religious Studies Project. We are Giuseppe Bellotta and Catherine Shear. And this is the first installment in our series on religious and NGOs. Since the turn of the 21st century, there has been a remarkable surge of interest among both policymakers and academics into the effects that religion has on international aid and development. Within this broad field, the work of religious NGOs or faith-based organizations has garnered considerable attention. This series of podcasts for the Religious Studies Project seeks to explore how the discourses, practices, and institutional forms both religious actors and purportedly secular NGOs intersect, and how these engagements result in changes in our understandings of both the concepts of religion and development. While the service provision activities of some religious NGOs complement and enhance systems of low state capacity, others compete with state services and still others are seen as deploying service delivery in ways that build up support for political parties, religious NGOs depend on their ability to elude, enroll and subvert the state institutions, while states themselves adjust to the impact of these new actors in turn. In this interview with Robert Hafner about his ongoing research on Muslim NGOs in both Jakarta and Yogyakarta, we will talk with him about his findings and what they can show us about Islam and civil society in contemporary Southeast Asia. Before introducing our guest for today's interview, we would like to thank the Henry Luce Foundation for supporting our research on this topic and the production of this series. Speaking with us today, about religion and NGOs is Professor Robert Hafner. He is the director of the Institute on Culture, Religion and World Affairs and professor of cultural anthropology at Boston University. While Professor Hafner is an anthropologist long involved in the study of Muslim Southeast Asia, more specifically Muslim politics, ethics and law, he is also an interdisciplinary scholar and comparativist who carried out research on Christianity, Hinduism, and political secularism. He directed over a dozen research projects and among his numerous publications figure Civil Islam, Muslims and Democratizations in Indonesia, published in 2000, Making Modern Muslims, the Politics of Islamic Education in Southeast Asia, published in 2009, and most recently Sharia Law and Modern Muslim Ethics, published last year. A leading scholar on Islam, civic movements and democratization with an extensive field experience in Indonesia, we are glad to have Professor Hafna with us today to talk more specifically about the place of development among Indonesian Muslim NGOs. Thank you for being here with us on the Religious Studies Project. Thank you, for Professor Hafna. Giuseppe, you want to start with our first question? With pleasure. In your introduction to civil Islam, you explain how your research on Islam and democracy has been partly prompted by Indonesian colleagues and Muslim intellectuals. And you narrate how a member of a Muslim youth organization who had read one of your books confronted you with the unexpected question of whether you thought Muslims can create a civil society. All of this contributed to your decision to inquire more thoroughly into these and related questions. How do you see our role as researchers in writing and communicating about such highly complex and sensitive issues, not only in the academic arena, but also on the ground, with the people at the center of our studies. Thank you. One of the fascinating things about Indonesia is that, well, it's two things, actually, is that it has undergone uh, some of the most extraordinary political and cultural changes in the Muslim world, anywhere in the Muslim world. Over the span of the last 35 years, the country has gone from being a very authoritarian developmentalist state to being not a perfect 
but a well-functioning electoral democracy with a free press and a variety of other institutions that we associate with democracy. But the change has happened so rapidly, I think many people don't quite understand the role that Muslims and Muslims NGOs played in it. Going back briefly to my encounter in the early 1990s, it was actually 1991 when I began my research in Jakarta. Prior to that time, in fact, in the late 1970s and then again in 1985, I had worked in East Java in an area which was majority Muslim and where a very large, the largest Muslim social welfare organization in the world called Nadat Ulama, and who had its base, it was a very, very strong but moderately conservative, not extremely conservative, moderately conservative Islamic social welfare organization. And it was a region in which in 1965-66, at the dawn of the authoritarian regime that ruled Indonesia from 1966 to 19, or 1998, Enu had played a central role in the destruction and, in fact, massacre, mass killings of members of the Communist Party many of whom were Muslim in background, but not particularly observant. So I had this experience from earlier when I went to Jakarta in 1991, and I had already published a book about, among other things, the political change that led up to the great changes of the 80s and the 90s. But I had written a good deal, too, about the role of Enu and the killing. So when I went to this meeting at the invitation of some members, Muslim youth members of Nadat Ulama, I went there with a little bit of reservation, knowing that other people in Anu and other people in the Muslim community had criticized some of my comments <laughs> on uh, the events of 65-66. And to uh, my surprise, the first gentleman who asked me a question raised his hand, and he was, he was almost trembling with intense purpose, and at first I thought he was angry. But his question was, Professor Hefner, on the basis of Enu's involvement in the killing of communists in 1965-66, do you really think Muslims can possibly create a civil society? And I was shocked. I was astonished. And there were, in the course of the next hour and a half that I spoke with them, there were strong expressions of concern and self-critique of the role of Muslims in what these Enu youth said was buttressing, really, the authoritarian regime of the New Order. So this was my first exposure in a, of what would become, in the period from 1991 to 1999, a long series of engagements with Muslim NGOs, both Anu, Muhammadiyah, and also some smaller organ, independent organizations. Mm -hmm. And I learned from that that actually Jakarta, but also Indonesia generally, was the home of some of the most vibrant Muslim civil society organizations uh, anywhere in the Muslim world. In fact, I would today, in the retrospect of more than 30 years of working in Indonesia, say that Indonesia has the largest Muslim, as well as non-Muslim, but the largest Muslim NGO and Muslim civil society organizational structure and network of associations of anywhere in the Muslim world. Rather extraordinary story. In any case, I then, from 91 to 99, spent those years working with a series of NGOs, including one called LP3ES, which was a kind of amalgam of Muslims from a relatively conservative, but still pro-democracy social welfare organization, and then Muslims who had earlier been associated with Indonesia's Social Democratic Party. So I watched the way in which they grappled with a whole new slew of issues, including the question of religious tolerance, the question of what one does on matters of how one engages matters of religious freedom, and an issue, another issue, which was very hot already in the 1990s, and it has remained so to this day, which is the question of women's equality. Mm -hmm. It was the beginning of a kind of re-education on my part, of my understanding this huge organization that I had originally met in the countryside in East Java, in villages, meeting with relatively conservative but very decent Muslims, that this organization had somehow given birth to a remarkable social welfare movement, and then a wing of it had become a pillar, arguably the most important pillar, in Indonesia's pro-democracy movement, a movement which, in combination with a great variety of social organizations, including secular nationalists, but also including Christians and Hindus, would, in May of 1998, uh, succeed in, if you will, pushing President Suharto from power and initiating an inauguration to a new electoral 
democracy in Indonesia, one which during its first years had great trouble, one which during its first three years in particular saw outbreaks of ethno-religious violence, but which the country weathered, and though there are still problems on questions of religious tolerance, Today, it stands as one of the most successful democracies anywhere in the global south, and certainly, certainly by far the most, most successful Muslim-majority democracy. And those Muslim NGOs that I first sort of had encountered in the countryside, but most dramatically in the decade of the critical decade of the 1990s, are a major part of the story of how a Mus this Muslim-majority country became democratic. Sorry to interrupt the episode, but we just wanted to let you know to remind you about our Patreon link. The Religious Studies Project has always been free since its inception, but we know that there's a great problem in academia with uh, people not being paid for the work that they're expected to do, particularly early career scholars. And we at the RSP want to be part of the solution, not part of the problem. So you can help if you can spare even one pound a month by going to patreon.com slash projectrs and subscribing. We know that these podcasts are very useful for people who are teaching and people in their learning. So if you can help either by subscribing there or by making a one-off donation using the PayPal button on our website, it would be greatly appreciated and will help us keep bringing you this podcast for free and fight against exploitation in academia. But now, back to the episode. Thank you. That is a fascinating, fascinating story. That leads me to ask you, how have particular organizations that you have been following in Java, more specifically in, Yok in Yogyakarta, been shaped by the political legal context in which they are working and how have they contributed to shape it more specifically? I mean, you have already introduced elements on this, but if you can explain us some further. After 1999 and Indonesia's transition return to electoral democracy, I decided that I would put my Jakarta research phase behind me and return to working, not in the countryside in this instance, but working in a non-capital region. So I chose Yogyakarta in part because I had university affiliation there, but also because Yogyakarta had a reputation of being, even though it's a relatively small city by Indonesian standards, it's a half million, it's a kind of intellectual center. It's also a cultural center, and I love Japanese culture, so I, for me and now I had children, it seemed like a good place to position ourselves. But the other reason, and the more serious reason that I decided to sort of shift back to a non-capital region, to Jakarta in particular, is that I had come to realize that one of the major challenges that the democracy movement and all efforts of kind of social reform in Indonesia were confronting was the question of how to devise Islamic rationales for things like gender equality, mm -hmm. things like democracy, and things like religious pluralism. And as I said, during the first years of this great transition back from 32 years of authoritarian rule, there were serious outbreaks of violence across Indonesia. Some 10,000 people died primarily in violence between Christians and Muslims, although the dynamic wasn't by any means exclusively and in some instances even primarily about religion. But the question of how to, if you will, disseminate this idea, this new institution Support Muslim support for this new institution of democracy loomed much, much more centrally in the aftermath of the return the sun and for many people unexpected return to democracy. So I began working in Jogja. I sort of stumbled onto a group that some people had told me about when I was still working in Jakarta in the 90s. And it was a group of mid-20s Muslim youth, graduates of the State Islamic University. Most of them had spent their youth in madrasas, the Indonesian equivalent of madrasas, which are known as Pondo Pesantra and Pesantra. So they came from a kind of archetypical Nadatul Ulama background, had not had a kind of secular education or things like that. But after graduating, the equivalent of their first degree, a BA, in Islamic studies, they had established an NGO whose purpose was really to address this issue of working within the Islamic tradition and in particular within the jurisprudential tradition, which is known as fiqh in Islamic tradition, working within that to, if you will, invite people. They couldn't do it themselves. They had to make this a kind of national collaborative effort to invite people to rethink collectively together the 
grounds for justifying things like representative democracy, gender equality, and uh, the thorniest of all, actually, is the question of religious tolerance, because there are within the Fek tradition major kind of precedents that for identifying non-Muslims in a way that makes modern notions of equal citizenship difficult. Here were these mid-twenties, they were then mid-twenties, uh, young guys, and I began working with them, and it was another, it was another one of these transformative moments for me, because I followed them out to the countryside, out to the Indonesian madrasas, the Pasantana, where they gave courses, but they didn't, they weren't in a position because they were young, even though they were quite smart and they knew the tradition of the jurisprudential tradition. They couldn't just sort of arrive and say, okay, here's what we need to do. They had to work in a very collaborative way, in a way that was respectful of established religious scholars, and if you will, open a dialogue that really would then continue over many years. And again, this was this was happening. They were part of a network. They were a key node because they were also a publishing house. The group I'm referring to is called LKKIS, which is the Institute for the Study of Islam and Society, if you right. translate it. And they were a publishing house as well. So they were one very critical node in what was from the mid 1990s, even before the return to democracy, to today a node, a network of Muslim activists who were trying to work from within the tradition and work with scholars, including some who were quite conservative, to bring about a cultural shift. And this has proved to be a much more serious challenge, I think, than many people might have hoped. It didn't surprise me. There were countercurrents. There are, particularly since 2005, there's been kind of an upsurge in kind of some conservative currents in Indonesia, very some very conservative, but these efforts continue, and once again, they are part of the Indonesian story and part of the reason that in Indonesia today, however much certain issues are still under debate, questions of, for example, democracy, the importance of the rule of law, the separation of powers. These ideas are now very much received by the Muslim mainstream in this country. So again, I witnessed their efforts. I participated in some of their their meetings with religious scholars. And above all, I learned a lot about the importance of this new breed, new species of Islamic NGO that had, at this critical moment in the democratic transition, jumped forward to, if you will, to do the normative work for justifying a, what is a significant kind of readjustment in Islamic legal and political thought. Thank you so much, Professor Hafner. Your work in Indonesia is really, really meaningful, even on a comparative perspective. Your work in Indonesia over the years has highlighted the dynamic nature of discourses on democratization, pluralism, and religious freedom. What would you highlight as the major points that your long-term experience in Indonesia could contribute to broader conversations on the role of religion in civil society in a global context? Uh, there's so much there, one doesn't know quite where to begin, but the first thing that I would say is something that I say when I am invited by Muslim colleagues and friends to go, particularly when it, uh, it, I'm not speaking with Muslim academics or Indonesian academics, but I'm invited to go out into the countryside and meet with people whose lives have changed so dramatically, both because of political changes, but also because there's been an educational revolution in Indonesia. There, everywhere in the countryside, you find children who have graduated from high school. When I first began my work in Indonesia, the average Indonesian had about a fourth grade education. Today, it's, it's just short of a high school education. So there's all sorts of changes that have taken place. But when I go to those ordinary Indonesian settings, one of the points that I try to make is something that I've learned from my Muslim friends, and which I also convey when I have traveled, for example, and been invited to give lectures in places like Turkey or Egypt or India, where there's not great interest in Indonesia, but a little. And one of the, the message that I make in those countries, but also more significantly within Indonesia, has always been that, you know, democracy it may have achieved an earlier development in Western parts of the Western world, but it is very much a, an instrument, a tool 
a social tool for dealing with difference, negotiating difference of all of humanity. It's therefore a kind of generalized, well, it isn't a kind of made in the West institution. Mm -hmm. Indeed, even in the West, a democracy takes different forms because it has to accommodate itself to different social, political, legal, and ethical environments. And we shouldn't be surprised. In fact, we should very much expect that that will be the case in the Muslim world as well, within certain limits. And there has to be family resemblance. There has to be some kind of institutional and ethical core, and I think there is. But the idea that some conservative Islamists who reject democracy and pluralism and things like that, that, the idea that they promote is that, no, no, democracy is a Western value, a Western institution. And my point, and it's a point that isn't my idea, it's the idea that I've learned from speaking with my friends in Enu and Muhammadiyah and other major Muslim social organizations in Indonesia, is that, no, democracy, particularly in its modern form, is an invention of humankind to deal with certain kinds of challenges of living together in the world that we inhabit. So democratization is not westernization. It is something that builds on and must build on the, and have roots in the ethical, legal, and cultural traditions of each society in which it takes roots. So that's my first and rather, I, I don't think that's particularly original or insightful. And it's one that I learned indeed from that Above all, beginning with that meeting in 1991, when that young, earnest, decent man, reflecting on the trauma of not that the ulama's involvement, feeling ashamed, as he, those were words he used, for what had happened. And, and that was the beginning of my re-education into the culture, politics, and ethics of Muslim Indonesia. And I think that basic lesson is very much generalizable to other parts of the world. We will just speak for, with Professor Efter for hours, but, but our time is over. So thank you, thank you very much, Professor Efter, for joining us in the Religious Studies Project. Thank you very much. It's been an honor and a pleasure. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Thanks so much for that first episode in this series of Religion and NGOs. The next one, although it won't be for two weeks, because we're doing them alternate weeks, remember, is about faith-based organizations in comparative perspective, and that's with Erica Bornstein. So do come back for that. But before you do, you should come back next week um, to hear uh, Sammy Bishop speaking with James Spickard. And it's an interview around the topic of one of his recent books to do with a presentation that he gave at the Socrel conference this year. And it's called Alternative Sociologies of Religion Through Non-Western Eyes. I'm really looking forward to that interview, um, taking that whole notion that the study of religion or specifically the sociology of religion here is quite a Western construct. So how does the sociology of religion look uh, from non-Western eyes, which would be great. And that ties in quite well to the sort of first big series that we did on the RSP, which was a guest just last year. Um, So uh, the Socrel anniversary series. Yeah, supported by BSA Socrel. So that'll tie in nicely with that. As was this one, this was recorded at Socrel. Sammy was invited down to the conference and recorded a few interviews for us. There we go. Um, so there's a lot of synergy there. Well, it, it fits quite nicely with the afterworld religion stuff, critiquing the kind of Western imperial implicit in the standard approaches to religious studies. Exactly. And you can get that book on uh, Routledge. Uh, <laughs> nice work. <laughs> uh, we've always got to get that plug in there. So come back for that next week. Come back on Thursday as ever for the response. Come back on Wednesday for the Opportunities Digest. That's well, Tuesday, David. You can come back on Wednesday. It'll still be there. It will still be there. (laughs) (laughs) And, you know, check us out in all the usual places. I'm going to pass over to our usual outro. But first, Chris is going to say, thanks for listening. Thanks for listening. The Religious Studies Project is sponsored by the British Association for the Study of Religions, the North American Association for the Study of Religion, and the International Association for the History of Religions. Brought to you by Founders and Editors-in-Chief Chris Cotter and David Robertson, and Managing Editor Thomas J. Coleman III. Our features are edited by Jonathan Tuckett, and our opportunities digest by Yana Shirley. Podcast transcription by Helen Bradstock, with audio assistance from Gregory Schneider and Samuel Ward. Social media managed by Ray Radford, and sales and marketing by Sammy Bishop. Don't forget you can support the project using our amazon.com.co.uk and .ca links or by donating at patreon.com backslash project rs and you can find us on facebook twitter google plus youtube itunes and other portals <laughs>